Hey guys, my name is Joe, and today we're going to be talking about hormone-sensitive lipase. Before we get specifically to that, though, let's take a step back and look at lipid catabolism as a whole. So lipid catabolism is breaking lipids down, and there's a bunch of different types of lipids. We have um, phospholipids that make up membranes. We have triacylglycerol glycerols that make up um, all of your storage molecules. So all this fat that you've got stored on your belly and hips and thighs and wherever you want to get rid of it, those are triacylglycerols. We've got sphingolipids on myelin sheaths. Cholesterol is a lipid. Let's not forget that one. Um, and the point is we've got a couple different types of lipids. The one we're going to be focusing on today is called triacylglycerol. Triacylglycerols, like I said, are the storage molecules. So when I say tags, as I'm going to call them, you should think storage molecules. So all this, this, you know, I guess up here, if you've got a lot of it, um, are stored as triacylglycerols. What exactly does a triacylglycerol look like? If we take a look at the name, it tells us that we've got a glycerol backbone, right? Glycerol was just three carbons, where each carbon had an alcohol on it. So this is the glycerol part of triacylglycerols. And then we, triacyl just means we have three fatty acid chains coming off one off of each carbon. And these can be different, which is why I'm just drawing squiggles in. But this is the basic structure of a triacylglycerol, your storage molecule. So when we're breaking these down, because today we're going to be talking about breaking um, tags down, the first step is you have to separate the glycerol from the fatty acids. So we chop off the acyl groups, and we get three fatty acids, which are just these three tails, and we get a glycerol. The glycerol goes into glycolysis, just like glucose into the Krebs cycle, and you guys know that. Um, that's not on this test, so that's just a side note. The fatty acids are what's on this test. Those eventually get broken down to acetyl-CoA, which, as you guys remember, acetyl-CoA is the starting material for the Krebs cycle, so this acetyl-CoA goes over to the Krebs cycle. This isn't what we're going to talk about today, but I do want to throw it in there as an aside, is that under starvation conditions, like if you went, I don't know how long without food, a very long time, at least a couple days, you would take you would take the acetyl-CoA, and instead of routing it to the Krebs cycle, you would route it to these things called ketone bodies. The intermediate to go from acetyl-CoA to ketone bodies is HMG-CoA, uh, which should look familiar because it's also the intermediate for cholesterol synthesis. Um, so HMG-CoA can either be on the way to make ketone bodies or on the way, uh, if it's starvation, on the way to make ketone bodies, or can be on the way to make cholesterol if you're not starving. So that's just an aside, not what we're going to focus on today. Um, the point of this drawing being up here really is this first step. Because this first step, taking the triacylglycerols and converting it to fatty acids and glycerol, is the job of hormone-sensitive lipase, and that's what we're going to be focusing on today. All of this was really just kind of a warm-up for the big event. So let's draw an adipocyte. Leave a hole right there for a membrane receptor. All right, that's an adipocyte, which is just a fat cell. And running next to it is going to be a blood vessel. This picture comes from your notes. So we're just going to uh, explain it a little bit. So. Inside, let's keep drawing actually, this is an adipocyte right here. It's part of your adipose cells, this is blood. Inside of your adipocytes, you have these lipid droplets. So this here's a lipid droplet. And it's made out of triacylglycerols. So inside, of each adipocytes, this process that we're about to talk about is happening in a bunch of different places at once because each adipocyte is not one giant fat droplet. 
Each adipocyte has a bunch of little lipid fat droplets in it. Lipid fat, that's repetitive. Lipid droplets in it. So um, let's talk about hormone-sensitive lipase now and what it actually does. You have up here a G-protein coupled receptor. You don't, you don't really need to remember too much about how those work um, from the lipid metabolism section, but you do need to remember a little bit, just what we tell you about today. So you've got the G-protein coupled receptor, and the, this guy next to it is adenylyl cyclase. This should just be a review from the last test. Um, so the reason we call this hormone-sensitive lipase is because, well, let's look at the name. When you're not sure, just check out the name. Lipase means it's going to be breaking apart a lipid, specifically the triacylglycerols. Hormone sensitive means that it's affected by hormones. So the two that play a relevant role here are insulin and glucagon. Insulin, when insulin comes in and binds to this G-protein coupled receptor, nothing happens. So we're not going to draw out this whole pathway because well, insulin doesn't do anything. The one that does do something is glucagon. So that's the pathway that we're going to talk about. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense. You have insulin in your blood when you have a lot of glucose, right? When you have a lot of glucose, you've got a whole bunch of energy because you're going through glycolysis and the Krebs cycle and electron transport, so you don't need more energy. And the point of breaking apart a lipid droplet is so you can take the energy from it. So if you've got a whole bunch of insulin, that means you've got a whole bunch of energy. You're not going to need more energy. So that's why insulin doesn't actually do anything here. Now, glucagon, on the other hand, is released when there's not a lot of um, glucose in your blood. When you don't have a lot of glucose, you need some other energy source, um, which is where fat comes in. So let's say we've got a glucagon that comes in and binds to this G protein coupled receptor. If you guys remember back from when we talked about this, there were three subunits, the alpha and the beta and the gamma subunits on the G protein coupled receptor. Well, th th you're not gonna be tested on this part, but just so you know, the alpha subunit leaves, attaches to adenylyl cyclase, and this is the beginning of testable material. So when the alpha subunit attaches to adenylyl cyclase, if you guys remember, it takes ATP and it makes it into cyclic AMP. Now, a lot of students are always like, well, doesn't it take AMP and make it into cyclic AMP? Yes, technically it does, but that AMP comes from ATP to begin with, so don't worry about that tiny little detail. The point is that it somehow makes cyclic AMP. Now, what does cyclic AMP do? Cyclic AMP comes in and it activates protein kinase A. That's nothing new, that's also from the last test. So now we've got this activated protein kinase A. And now what does protein kinase A do? Well, it's a kinase, and kinases phosphorylate things. And so it actually goes, let me get a different colored marker here, it actually goes and phosphorylates two different things. The first thing it phosphorylates is hormone-sensitive lipase which is an enzyme. So when PKA comes in and phosphorylates this enzyme, it becomes active. So now you have this hormone-sensitive lipase and it's hungry, it wants to go eat things. The problem is, on the surface of this lipid droplet, we have a whole bunch of, you can think of them as bodyguards. They're called perilipins. And they coat the entire surface of the lipid droplet to protect it from anything coming and eating it because your body wants to protect its fat because it's how we're gonna live if we don't ever have food. So your body's trying to protect its fat so it has these perilipins that protect the outside of the lipid droplet. And now hormone sensitive lipase, even when it's active, can't get through the perilipins. So now what happens is PKA realizes this and it also goes and phosphorylates the perilipins. 
Now, when these perilipins are phosphorylated, then they let the phosphorylated hormone-sensitive lipase in. Right, so you have to have both of these things phosphorylated for this process to happen, which is why protein kinase A just phosphorylates them both at the same time. So if we were to continue this, um, let's see, if we were to redraw this, we would now have hormone-sensitive lipase attached to the lipid droplet, and it's still phosphorylated. And it's surrounded by perilipins that have now let it in. That is my masterful artwork. All right, so now hormone-sensitive lipase is attached to the lipid droplet. And the next step, you don't need to know how it happens. Just know that it does. You have all of these triacylglycerols in here. Hormone-sensitive lipase brings them outside of the lipid droplet and breaks them apart into glycerol and the free fatty acids, specifically three free, fat, three free fatty acids, a little tongue twister there. The glycerol goes off into glycolysis. We're not going to worry about that today. What we are going to worry about are these three free fatty acids. Now, we know that fatty acids are lipid soluble, right? They're lipids, so they're going to be lipid soluble, which means they can cross the membrane. So they do. They just diffuse across the membrane and then diffuse across the membrane of the blood vessel and they find themselves in the blood. Now blood is mostly made up of water. And since lipids are fat soluble, that means they're not water soluble. So now you have all of these lipids inside of our bloodstream that are not water soluble, so they're going to want to coagulate. And that would be really bad because you would have a giant clot of fat floating through your arteries. And could you imagine if that got stuck in something in your brain and it popped? It would just be bad. The point is, the point is you do not want free fatty acids floating around on their own in your blood, which is why I even mentioned that. So our body, being as brilliant as it is, has invented a protein. I like to draw it kind of like a skateboard or a surfboard, surfing through the blood. Uh, but it, it's a protein, and it's called serum albumin. Serum albumin takes the free fatty acids from the blood, and it carries them to wherever in your body it needs to go. So serum albumin, you can think of as a carrier molecule. It is a carrier molecule. It carries free fatty acids from the adipocyte to wherever in your body they need to be used. Uh, for example, muscles use a lot of this when you're working out. All right, so we've talked about glucagon, and now if you guys are wondering, crap, how do I remember if glucagon does this or if insulin does this, I, I just can, can't keep that straight in my head, we've got a little rhyme for you. So all of this works when it's phosphorylated, right? So the rhyme is, glucagon puts the phosphates on. That's glucagon puts the phosphates on, which turns all of this pathway on. So if insulin were to bind here, none of this would happen, and the lipid droplet would just stay where it is. All right, that is as complicated as hormone-sensitive lipase is. I wanted to make sure you guys saw this before your test. If you have any questions, post them in the comments, and I'll be sure to answer them. Thank you. The Teaching Center, UF's Learning Resource Center.